The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the fifth day of the seven day session, the first of two in a row here in January, 2022. And yesterday I shared with you something of a, uh, a short writing, a short ebook uh, that was written by Dan Siegel. <clears throat> uh, Dan Siegel, I can actually read his bio here. He's a, a prominent uh, neurologist and has a number of uh, excellent books out to the front of this. <clears throat> Dr. Daniel Siegel is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine and executive director of the Mind Sight Institute. He received his medical degree at Harvard Medical School, completed postgraduate medical education at the University of California, Los Angeles, training in pediatrics and child adolescent and adult psychiatry. Dr. Siegel is currently a clinical professor of psychiatry at UCLA School of Medicine and a founding co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. He's involved in mindfulness and developed the field of interpersonal neurobiology, an interdisciplinary approach that uses over a dozen branches of science to create a framework for understanding our subjective and interpersonal lives. And uh, I think one of his books actually is, is about uh, raising your kid, but... Um, he seems to be quite per, 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 perceptive uh, about um, children in particular. And uh, I think he must be a good child psychiatrist. So I, um, this is the part that I'd read yesterday. How do we help people see themselves as part of an integrated system? And you remember that uh, it is well known in, in Buddhism that uh, we are all interconnected. We are one. It's also well known in science that uh, there's nothing really that, that uh, is delineating between anything and anything else other than a more concentrated level of energy. <clears throat> so this is something that really, really important to understand in terms of our inner relationships with other people, particularly now in this time of the pandemic, when people are getting more and more um, upset, frightened, enraged, uh, triggered, and, and so to recognize that wild energy flying around it through us, and maybe we're part of it as well in terms of uh, active participants, uh, we're all passive participants at the very least because uh, we cannot not feel it. We can try to shut it down, but it's well known that um, people when they are in uh, normal close connection, as in, for example, college dorms or uh, other situations like that. They they tend their bodily um, uh, what processes tend to get in sync with each other. We are very very much connected, and what we do makes a difference. This is, this is the fundamental basis of uh, the, the Buddhist view on awakening. 
when when we awaken, we awaken more than just our self because our self is not not distinct enough from all energy, all life, all being. And the more we open and and allow our innate compassion and wisdom to rise and be functioning, the more that affects everybody around us and even unseen people. It's an important thing to note. We're not this narrow little self-image that we think we are. And that allows us an amazing amount of potential and, and flexibility. So <clears throat> in this page, he's talking about learning, learning to integrate better. How do you help people see themselves as part of an integrated system? How do you get them to value their relationships to one another and the world around them? I conducted a study of 10,000 people to find out the answer to this vital question. And all of our 10,000 participants took part in a strange practice called the Wheel of Awareness and recorded the results. It was a particularly, uh, a particular mindfulness-based practice, as I understand it. I do not know the details, but you can certainly find them out because he's written about them. What I found was that regardless of whether participants had never meditated before or had run monasteries for decades, they all had similar reactions to the wheel. One retired engineer described the reaction lucidly. He stood up at the end of one of these sessions, took the microphone. I just retired from a leading tech company. I'm 70 years old. My wife is a therapist and she dragged me here today. I've never done therapy, never done this dumb meditation stuff. But after we did this wheel thing and we took a break, I left the conference center and then tears started coming down his face. I went out into the park, he said, and there's a gardener watering the roses and the butterflies are flapping and the birds are flying around the gardener. And I realized that we're all interconnected. As we go more deeply into our practice, we too realize that. And here's the, the follow-up on this. All possibilities arise from a wider plane of possibilities, which is to say that while many things could happen, there are fewer things that are likely to. On the graph, the possibilities are represented by the flat plane, the sea of possibility. Then the possibilities of repre are represented from those cones, which, well, I don't think we want to share more of this because we're not able to see the, the graph. But let's go to the next part. And here is the graph, by the way. <clears throat> the reaction that people have had is incredible. They describe unbelievable joy, love, interconnection, spaciousness, openness as wide as the sky, as deep as the ocean infinite of infinity. Over and over and over again. After having conducted the study, and collected the data, I've synthesized my study together with the help of quantum physicists to understand what's going on. My proposal is thus, the knowing of consciousness comes from the plane of possibilities. Mindfulness and the presencing practices allow people to drop back into that plane of possibility and bypass restrictions placed on their minds cognating through their environment, including in-group, out-group, fight-or-flight reactions that can keep us reactive and isolated from one another. It brings us to a place where alternative thought patterns 
and ways of relating are possible again. After having conducted this study and collected the daddy, data, I have synthesized my study together with the help of quantum physics to understand what's going on. My proposal is thus, the knowing of consciousness comes from the plane of possibility. Mindfulness and presencing practices allow people to drop back into that plane of possibility and bypass restrictions placed on their minds, cognitive, cognating through that, their environment, including in-group, out-group, fight or flight reactions. It can keep us reactive and isolated from one another. It brings us to a place where alternative thought patterns and ways of relating are possible again. And Zazen, if we go deeply into it with persistence and commitment, brings forth this change. Something about Zazen. I've mentioned this in bits and pieces before. Uh, there are a number of my students who have come from other uh, centers where the format was Japanese, much more so the Japanese culture. And the Japanese culture and the American culture are very different. In the Japanese culture, individuals are not important. It is the group. And there's some good things that come out of that. People look to making other people comfortable. They look to helping out. This um, Buddhist dictum, uh, Bodhisattva, leaves no traces, comes out of that perspective. We don't want to leave behind a trail that will requ require somebody else to pick up after us or somebody else to have a challenge as a result of what we've left behind. This is a, an important aspect of Buddhist training and very positive. It involves uh, conscious thoughtfulness, uh, a bit of compassion, willingness to um, go beyond your own desires to make it easier for other people. This is not the same as uh, being codependent. This is simply taking care of your situation in such a way that you're not, as I said, leaving a trail behind you that is going to cause other people discomfort or problems. For example, when we leave the zendo, we leave our cushions neatly plumped up. If there's extra cushions, we put them in, uh, beneath the tan. And, and so on and so forth. So when people walk into the Zendo, it's, it's, it's a, a neat, cared for environment. Uh, if you're in a relationship, you don't just drop your clothes, uh, dirty clothes in the middle of the floor uh, and expect somebody else to either have to step over them or pick them up, things like that. We all know what they are. But there's another aspect of, of Japanese culture that, that causes us problems in Zen practice. And that is the, a, a, a drivingness, a strivingness, uh, a kind of intensity that bulls through any kind of challenge. Uh, there's an expression in, in Japanese, ganbate kurasai, that means hang in there. And it's more than just hang in there. It's like, keep it going at all costs. And we're taught in the original Japanese way of training to just cut through, to just focus on mu or whatever koan you're on. And to not let anything else interfere. Uh, the problem with this is, well, there's several problems with this. One is that we tend to get very tight uh, and tightly wound up. Shoulders begin to go up 
it begins to have uh, be very difficult to relax and fall asleep uh, at, uh, at times when you can, um, well, I should say at times when the schedule allows or after Sashin. And we often will drive ourselves into nervous wrecks. I did that myself. Ha Queen did that and got sick because he was so, so um, striving. There's a different way to work. And that is to sink into that sea of possibility, to relax deeply into an increasingly open awareness, focused within, as you know, the, the Buddha, after six years of uh, trying to practice in an outward manner, and basically in a striving manner, starving himself, for example, uh, chose to go inward because he saw that what he'd been doing before was basically a dead end. And it was only when he sat down under the bow tree, and of course we like to say he just really uh, determined that he was gonna to come to awakening regardless of anything else. Well, he probably just sat down deeply absorbed in his question. Not tense, not striving, but an on an inward journey. And this is what brings results in our Zen practice. As part of that inward journey, we're going to run into any place we've shut down, any uncomfortable experience we don't want to feel again. Uh, uh, we're going to run into ideas about ourselves, which are just ideas. And that's important to recognize. We're going to run a um, uh, against this self-image that we have developed over so many years, our, our whole life, based on how other people responded to us or reacted to us or told us how we should be. I recently had an email from a, a woman veteran who had come to our uh, quite a few of our uh, regaining balance retreats for women veterans with PTSD. And she had a horrific story, um, several horrific stories actually. And it, and it began in, in her childhood. Uh, her family was uh, a mixed family and, and she ran uh, right smack into prejudice. She didn't fit anywhere. And uh, she's bright, she's lovely, she is deeply compassionate and, and ended up in, in uh, marriages with the wrong guys uh, who were severely abusive. But to her credit, she was able to extricate herself from, from them and is, has spent her whole life, once she got out of the military, and I suspect in the military as well, uh, working to help people who are suffering. It's been difficult for her to do Zazen. Initially easy because she has a, uh, a predisposition to it through yoga, but eventually she ran into uh, some history. And, and it was very difficult for her, but she's been working through it gradually, as we all can, as I myself did. But I can tell you that Zazen will ultimately liberate us if we persist in the right direction, if we don't try to block out anything difficult that comes up. We don't go chasing it. But if something comes up that is difficult, we sink into the experience in our body. 
and offer it radical acceptance. We don't have to like it. That's what radical acceptance is. It's, it's okay, this is how it appears to be. So I accept that it appears to be this way. And that there's something very positive that happens when we do that. If it's a major situation, as it was for this woman I spoke of, many major situations actually, um, then it's, it's especially helpful and, and actually important to get the help of a trained therapist to help you work through what's been going on. But in general, uh, Zazen can continue in a truly deeply functional way if we use that metaphor of sinking deeply within and opening to the experience of that. This is what Eugene Gendlin, a, a psychologist, uh, terms the felt sense. And this is something that a lot of us, any of us who have had any level of trauma, don't want to feel. Often we are disengaged from any felt connection with our bodies uh, for the reason that it's extremely uncomfortable. And that was the only way we could figure out, almost instinctively, uh, not to feel that discomfort. In modern day West, there are therapists that understand much more deeply how to work with these kinds of situations. So if they come up for you in Zazen, there's help. <clears throat> and it's not about trying to reach somewhere over there for some ideal thing called awakening or for the answer to a koan, if you've been assigned a koan. It's about sinking deeply into the need to return to what seems to have been lost, the need to reconnect, a sense of something vital just beyond the veil, as that woman spoke of. Uh, it's, this is the way to practice through a relaxed but aware, deeply focused practice. And when you do the extended out breath, the susokan, as it's called in Japan, <clears throat> it actually um, cuts to the chase, so to speak. It's a jet assist in the practice because you cannot extend your out breath without focusing. And you, you have to focus on the experience of it in your body for it to be effective. And you bring the, the breath, the out breath far enough out that um, it, it requires focus. And that focus requires uh, letting go of other involvements. As you do that practice, there's a, a sense of deep presence with that breath. At the same time, there's a, a subtle awareness of your environment. And that's all it needs to be, a subtle awareness. Now, anyone who's had trauma is going to have is going to have a very difficult time, uh, not, as I put it, keeping the sentry up there in the sentry box or up periscope scanning for danger. If that is happening, you tune, to the, tune into that experience. What does it feel like in your body to need to scan for danger? Allow yourself to become intimately familiar with your inner landscape and let your thoughts take care of themselves somewhere else. What you're doing with practice is working in a, in, in, with a part of your mind that is not uh, one of speech or thought. It's a deeper sense. It, it allows understanding that, that is much more accurate than any thought could provide.
I think that's the most important thing to say here is the practice works if we persist. If you need uh, some extra help and, and it's perfectly allowable, in fact, admirable to move on that need and get that extra help from, for example, a therapist, then, then do it. You will find as my therapist friends who are Zen practitioners, there were several, several people in Rochester at the Rochester Zen Center who were also therapists. And they, uh, every single one of them said that when a person is doing Zazen on a regular basis and is in therapy, their ther therapy and their Zazen proceed much faster. And that was my experience as well. Not only that, but Zazen, because it is, um, it teaches an experiencing at a level that's not cognitive. It's not, not thought uh, directed. Uh, I, was, I was a graphic artist uh, professionally and did other design work, architecture and, and interior design. And all of a sudden I began to realize that I was getting better at it. It was easier, it flowed more readily as a result of the ongoing zazen I was doing. Whatever you do as a vocation, um, if you're a musician, for example, uh, whether it's that's your first, uh, uh, what shall we say, um, your, 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 your first work, or whether it's just a side hobby, you'll find your music flows more readily. You'll, you'll be able to forget yourself so much more deeply, so much more quickly, and the music will flow, whatever instrument you're, you're using. If you're an artist, and I, I've heard this from other artists as well, the same, the art gets better, it gets easier. Whatever your life mission is, whatever you're drawn to, to work, um, and it really doesn't matter what it is, the more you forget yourself, the more you will free up inner resources to do it more creatively, better, more easily, more quickly. Yeah, Zazen is amazing. But if we try to force it, uh, Hakuin at one point talked about tongue pressed against palate and your fingernails digging into your palms. That is not the way to practice. And he found out, out the hard way. He almost died. And it wasn't until he learned, he said, from a 300-year-old hermit, uh, mountain hermit, to bring his energy down gradually. And, and if you look in, into his teachings, uh, you can find that exact way he did it. And so um, he imagined a, a lump of a buttery, sweet-smelling elixir on top of his head, gradually melting down, down, down within. And this is why in Rinzai Zen, and he is kind of the father of Japanese Rinzai Zen, um, there is so much emphasis on the hara, the, the belly, the tanden, whatever you want to call it. It's also emphasized in martial arts to live from your hara, not from your head. It works better that way. And in that way, he was finally able to relax and that's how he ended up having um, so many more Kensho experiences, so many more awakening experiences. And that is an option for every one of us. Awakening is infinite. The deeper we go, the deeper it is. And the opportunity is even more deep. So don't, don't stop. Zazen has incredible benefit. 
And of course, it's also very challenging many times. But at a certain point, when you've got enough Zazen under your belt, you'll recognize that when it's challenging, that is the most optimal time to practice. You get your teeth into it. Uh, somehow the breath eludes you, but you persist, you persist, you persist. And then it will come back deeper, longer than it was before. Somehow you've, you've moved through some unseen, unknown obstacle and gotten deeper and gotten more let go because it was the obstacle that was keeping you trapped. Zazen is amazing. The results are amazing if we persist. So I hope every single one of you does because it will be so very worth it. One other caveat, and that is, it's important to work with a, an experienced, genuine teacher of Zen. Because that can help a lot. Someone who's been through it themselves and met those obstacles and, and uh, gone down those blind alleys and, and um, found their way back to the main road uh, it can can be of enormous help because uh, they can say, "Hey, uh, you're you're heading off in the wrong direction with this. If you back up and go back to ground zero, you'll be able to on the right be on the right track, and you'll move forward that way." So that's it. That's us in this miraculous practice. First, it shows us where we're caught, and then it sets us free. These are the words of a person who was also training when I was there at the Rochester Zen Center, who had a devil of a time in a sashin, but had a kensho at, towards the end of that sashin, and that was what she said afterwards. So thank you for listening. I stop now and recite the four vowels. <clears throat>